The world we live in is a story, a story written by someone else. And we have books and we have paintings and we have myths and legends. But do we know what's really true? Because everything we get is secondhand information. As we know, history, or more to the point, his story, is written by the winners, by the conquerors. Those who go in and destroy societies then rewrite the story in their own image. And we are left here to try and put the puzzle pieces back together because we've been looking at this for a while and our story is wrapped up in the information we're given but it is wrapped up and much of it has been hidden and when we look back in history we find you know there seems to be a, a date or well, you know a time around the 1500s where all the information suddenly changed uh, the information about the place we inhabit changed our sciences changed our laws changed and that change has continued and when we go back it's hard to find things credible information from before the 500 years ago so we have to dig and put the pieces together and see what matches up so that we can come up with our story. Hi guys, how are you going? Campbell here from Autodidactic Channel. Hope you're all having a wonderful day, a day full of wonder because that's what this realm really is. It's all about wonder. It's an adventure and it's up to us to crack the code and win the game. So where are we? Where, what is this realm we find ourselves on? You know, everything has been changed so much uh, that we really need to look and obviously, and we see this at the moment so much, how they can actually control and manipulate stories and only tell their side of the story. So we only get half the story. But that's only been going on for a certain amount of time. So I wanted to have a look at King Arthur because I came across some interesting information. So King Arthur was a legendary British leader who, according to medieval histories and romances, led the defence of Britain against the Saxon invaders in the late 5th and early 6th centuries. The details of Arthur's stories are mainly composed of folklore and literary invention. And modern historians generally agree that he is unhistorical. The sparse historical background of Arthur is gleaned from various sources, including the Annals of Cambriae, the Historia Britorium, and the writings of Gildas. Arthur's name also occurs in early poetic sources, such as the Y. Gogadin. So they tell us that Arthur is basically a mythical person. Uh, the details are sparse, and he was supposed to be a king in England in the five and six hundreds. And here we have a depiction of Arthur. And there's obviously with King Arthur, there are lots of other stories attached to him, uh, like Merlin the Magician, which would be a Magi connection, and the Sword in the Stone which is Excalibur, King Arthur's sword. And interesting to note that most of the word Excalibur is calibre, as in guns, uh, gun barrel width. And of course the Holy Grail. 
and I will get into those but what we're going to do now is have a look at why Gogadon and it's a medieval Welsh poem consisting of a series of elegies to the men of of the Bretonic kingdom of Gogadon and its allies who according to the conventional interpretation died fighting the Angles of Delra and Venetia a place named Catraeth in about AD 600. It is traditionally ascribed to the band Aneron and survives only in one manuscript, the book of Aneron. So this is uh, Gogodon. It's an old poem and it lists a fight or a battle and basically uh, the heroes of Gogodon lose against the Angles, and the Angles were one of the main Germanic peoples who settled in Great Britain in the post-Roman period. Uh, obviously, the Anglo-Saxons is how we know those uh, them today, but that's an interesting word, isn't it? The Angles. Now, this battle was at Catraeth, and the Battle of Catraeth was fought around AD 600 between a force raised by Gogadon and the Brythonic people of the Hen Olgeget or Old North of Britain and the Angles of Benicia and Dira. It was evidently an assault by the Gogodon party on the Angle stronghold of Catre of Catraeth, perhaps is uh, Catterick or North Yorkshire. The Gogodon force was said to have consisted of warriors from all over the Hen Ogled or the north and even some from as far afield as Gwynedd and North Wales or Pictolan. The battle was disastrous for the Britons who were nearly all killed. The slain warriors were commemorated in the important early poem Gogodon, attributed to Anaren. So uh, this battle of Catraeth, basically the people of Gogodon and uh, King Arthur is linked to this, went up and attacked people called the Angles, who had a stronghold in Catraeth. Uh, but they don't, they don't know where Catraeth was, but they are saying it was in the north. And I saw a video by Art of Dino yesterday. I will leave the link in the description below. And he was reading a very interesting letter. And it is a letter between John D. Uh, and King Arthur, well actually it's between uh, Mercator I think, and the conquest of the Arctic. Okay, King Arthur and the conquest of the Arctic. Uh, this is the Institute of Archaeology from the University of Oxford. And it says down here, uh, the, the letter is a detailed study of John Dee's late 16th century claim that King Arthur conquered the far northern world and North America. Far northern world. Although sometimes treated as Dee's own invention, the concept of Arthur as a conqueror of the Arctic and even parts of North America clearly antedates Dee. One witness to it is the Geste Arthuri, which was seamed and summarized by Jacob Noen who probably wrote in the 14th century, this medieval document apparently describes Arthur's attempts to conquer the far north, including an expedition launched against the North Pole itself. Another witness is the Legus Anglorum Londonus Collectae, which dates from the start of the 13th century and provides a list of Arthur's northern conquests, including Greenland, Vinland and the North Pole. On the basis of these and other documents, it would appear that the concept of Arthur as an Arctic, as an Arctic conqueror, can be traced at least to the late 12th century, if not before. Uh, so I'll leave the link to this page below as well. And uh, so there you go. Did you know? Did, did you ever think that King Arthur was uh, on boats up in the Arctic? conquering the North Pole.
Uh, from 1577 to 1588, the English polymath John Dee was engaged in manufacturing and disseminating some extraordinary claims on behalf of the English monarchy and its imperial ambitions. Most intriguingly, Dee, generally seen as the originator of the phrase the British Empire, argued that Queen Elizabeth could assert dominion over a vast tract of the northern globe and the new world, partially by dint of its having once been conquered and ruled by the Tudors' reputed early medieval ancestor, King Arthur. In his most important treatment of the issue, the Britannici Imperial Limitis, or the limits of the British Empire, from 1578, he wrote that Elizabeth could claim title royal to to all the coasts and islands beginning at or about Terra Florida, and so alongst or near uh, Vinto Atlantis or America, going northerly and then to all the most northerly islands, great and small, and so uh, compassing about Greenland eastward and to the territories opposite and the furthest easterly and northern bounds of the Duke of Moscovia and his dominions. So all the northern lands, and then it goes down here, like I said, there's lots and lots of stuff. Now, if you don't know who John Dee is, uh, check him out. He's basically uh, one of the, how should we say, one of the architects. And he sits pretty much right at that point as well in the 1500s where everything was changing and he was someone who was in the know of the old world and he had, uh, you know, he had access to all these old world documents, which I'm sure still exist somewhere, probably in the Vatican and other places. Uh, so he knew what was going on, and but he was using that information to bring in the new world, to let the new, you know, king and queen take over the world, basically. But it's, yeah, so the the Arctic and King Arthur. So most of you have seen uh, maps similar to this. Uh, this is the regions of Hyperborea and as you can see this is Hyperborea or Hyperborea. In the middle here we have uh, Mount Maru basically is what it is. I'm not sure what that says. Down here you can see it says Pygmy, Pygmy, Pygmies little people uh, they are mentioned in the letter uh, I'll, I'll, I'll leave the link for that as well the actual letter from Makeda to John D so yeah so this we have all this four lands we have four main rivers going in and these are divided up you can see there's many entrances because we've got tributaries here uh, we've got Greenland which oh actually no sorry this is Greenland what's that Gronk Rockian. So this is another island here. This is Greenland, Gronland, which uh, seems to keep changing shape. And obviously we have, you know, Russia, Americas, and all this in the map. So we've got the Americas too. This is in the 1500s uh, after it was discovered. But yeah, they're telling us that there's land up here at the North Pole. This is another map, and this is again from the 1500s and it's a map of the world this is sort of the time when it was starting to flatten out and change the maps but you can see up in the corner here we have a top view we have Atlantis Atlantis in Solva that's actually America that's what they used to call it remember I just read something saying that was called Atlantis in that John D letter uh, but here we have Hyperborea and the Arctic Pole. And that is 1597, that map. Here we have another one. This one is 1570. And as you can see, it's uh, a map of the northern part. We've got Septen uh, Septentri, Septentriona, which means north. Uh, the oceans of Hyperboreas, Greenland, and what do we have here? But land masses looking very similar to that top shot that we got. We've still got this island here, 
which seems to have disappeared. And here it says the inhabitants are pygmies. So this is where the pygmies live. That's the same island. But the other one said pygmies. So we've got you know lots of maps that from the same time that are saying the same thing. And it, of course you can see this sort of landmass. It's a little bit different here. Uh, Friesland. I think this is probably Iceland down here somewhere. I'm not sure. Maybe this is Iceland. But yeah, definitely we have land masses up here. And then what happened, this map here is, uh, it says 1688. So this is, you know, about 100 years later, we, we seem to lose the Arctic region. It just disappears. And we get left with maps like this, but when all we're giving, given is these circles. And there's nothing there. Look at this. The most northern is uh, okay. That's Spitz, Spitzberg, Spitzland. Um, but the landmass is gone. Okay, up here we have Arctic, and you can see it goes way up, and the landmass is gone. And then we have all this nice. Phoenician based uh, artworks up here with all the usual suspects. So clearly, uh, something's changed here. Something's, there you go, 1688. And if we go in here, is that an I? Looks a lot smaller than this 688, doesn't it? Uh, is there an I around? It's dotted. It does actually look the same, just without the dot. I six eight eight in the year of Iusa. But this is definitely Phoenicians. You know, they love to get their gear off. They love their flowers and their florets and all this kind of stuff and their cherubims. So yeah, this is uh, after the Phoenicians have taken over in the sixteen hundreds. The Arctic has disappeared. Okay, so this is the actual letter. Uh, a letter dated 1577 from Makeda to John D. And I'll leave the link. Uh, as I said before, I got this from Art of Dino, and I'll leave the link to his video where he actually reads the whole letter. Uh, so I won't go through it all, but just so you know, it says uh, he wrote in the Belgic language the ideas about the northern regions, which some time ago I extracted from him. Follow word for word, save where the sake of brevity or speed I have translated into Latin, when if not always his words, I have retained his meaning. In North Norway, which is called Dusky Norway, there are three months of darkness, during which there is no sunlight, but a perpetual twilight. This North Norway lies over and against a country called the Province of Darkness, or the Obscure Province in Latin, Provincia Tenebrosa. Concerning it, however, there is nothing written in Marco Polo, and this province of darkness is the most western bound of the Grand Cham's land. Now, the Grand Cham, he was the king of Tartaria. And between this province and dusky Norway, there is only 12 miles of sea, so pretty close. Dusky Norway, uh, interesting uh, use of words. From North Norway, you cannot reach the indrawn seam, which lies beyond Greenland, for it lies still further northward. This North Norway stretches as far as the mountain range, which encompasses the North Pole. Okay, and as we saw on those maps, there was a mountain range encompassing the North Pole. Uh, the borders of this mountain range are for 17 miles by land, the rest is by sea, and it goes down into there and sort of describes it a little bit and how, how yeah, how there's a land mass up there, four islands etc etc and uh yeah it goes on a bit so i'll leave this for you like i said there's a bit you can read and so this is 1500s 1577 and he's saying that from all the information he can gather there is a land in the north up near the arctic circle with a mountain range surrounding it and this is Shambhala, and Shambhala, well this isn't Shambhala, <laughs> this is an article on Shambhala, 
And Shambhala was a place that's talked about in both the Hindu and the Buddhist uh, histories and philosophies. Shambhala, which is a Sanskrit word meaning place of peace or place of silence, is a mythical paradise spoken of in ancient texts, including the Kala Chakra Tantra and the ancient scriptures of the Zhang Zung culture, which predate Tibetan Buddhism in Western Tibet. According to the legend, it is a land where only the pure of heart can live, a place where love and wisdom reigns and where people are immune to suffering, want or old age. Shambhala is said to be the land of a thousand names. It has been called the forbidden land, the land of the white waters, land of the radiant spirits, land of the free fire, land of the living gods, land of the wonders, and the Hindus called it Avatha, the land of the worthy ones. The Chinese know it as He Xian, the Western Paradise of He Wang Mu, and the Russian old believers it is known as Belovoid. But throughout Asia it is best known by its Sanskrit name Shambhala or Shangri-La. Now Shangri-La is from a book in 1933 uh, where it was basically renamed. So as you can see this uh, this legend or this land has names in, in all cultures. The prophecy of Shambhala. The concept of Shambhala plays an important role in Tibetan religious teachings and has particular relevance in Tibetan mythology about the future. The Kalachakra prophecies the gradual deterioration of mankind as the as the ideology of materialism spreads over the earth. When the barbarians who follow this ideology are unified under an evil king and think there is nothing left to conquer, the mists will lift and reveal the snowy mountains of Shambhala. The barbarians will attack Shambhala with a huge army equipped with terrible weapons. Then the king of Shambhala will emerge from Shambhala with a huge army to vanquish dark forces and usher in a worldwide golden age. Through the Kalachakra prophecies of future war, this appears in conflict with the vows of the Buddhist teachings that prohibit violence. This has led to some theologians to interpret the war symbolically. But Shambhala, uh, over many centuries, numerous explore, explorers and seekers of spiritual wisdom have embarked on expeditions and quests in search of the mythical paradise of Shambhala, and while many have claimed to have been there, no one has yet provided any evidence of its existence or been able to pinpoint its physical location on a map. However, most references place Shambhala in the mountain, uh, the mountainous regions of Eurasia. Ancient Zhangzhong texts identify Shambhala with the Suche Valley of Punjab or the Himalaya Pradesh, India. Mongolians identify Shambhala with certain valleys. Tibetan sacred texts speak of a mystical kingdom called Shambhala hidden behind snow peaks somewhere north of Tibet, where the most sacred Buddhist teachings, the Kalachakra or Wheel of Time, are preserved. It is prophesied that a future king of Shambhala will come with a great army to free the world from barbarism and tyranny, and will usher in a golden age similar to similarly, the Hindu Puranas say that a future world redeemer the Kauki Avatara, the tenth and final manifestation of Vishnu, will come from Shambhala. Both the Hindu and Buddhist traditions say it contains a magnificent central palace radiating a powerful diamond-like light. The mythical paradise of Shambhala is known under many different names. It has been called the Forbidden Land, the Land of White Waters, the Land of Radiant Spirits, the Land of Living Fire, and the Land of Living Gods. Buddhist texts say that Shambhala can only be reached up by a long and difficult journey across the wilderness, deserts, and mountains, and warn that only those who are called and have the necessary spiritual preparation will be able to find it. Others will find only blinding storms, empty mountains, or even death. One text says that the kingdom of Shambhala is round, 
but it is usually depicted as an eight-petaled lotus blossom, a symbol of the heart chakra. Indeed, an old Tibetan story states that the kingdom of Shambhala is in your own heart. Uh, so again, there's a link, the spiritual to the physical there. Uh, directions are a mixture of realism and fantasy can be read at one level and instructions for taking an inner journey from the familiar world on the surface consciousness through the wilds of the subconscious to a hidden sanctuary of the superconscious that's the journey the spiritual journey to shambhala but nevertheless the idea of shambhala is also located in the material world is firmly rooted in the tibetan tradition opinions on whether a kingdom might lie however differ greatly and it says many people think that it might be in mongolia and in or tibet in the himalayan mountain range uh, but most believe that Shambhala is in Siberia or some other part of Russia. Some Lamas believe it is hidden in the desolate, uninhabited wastelands of the Arctic. According to Lama Kunga uh, Rinpoche, Shambhala is probably at the North Pole. Since the North Pole is surrounded by ice and Shambhala is surrounded by ice mountains, Finally, a few Lamas believe that Shambhala exists outside the earth on another planet or in another dimension. So there you go. Uh, Shambhala is described as being icy, surrounded by ice-covered mountains, and most uh, of the Lamas, the people who actually read the texts, uh, believe that it is at the North Pole. And this is the world map from 1587. And down here we have Ireland, Scotland and England. So this is Great Britain, as you can see, Ireland, Scotia and Ingle, England. And if we come up here, you'll see that at the top of Scotland, there's islands. Then we've got Hitlander, Frisland, Friesland, which pops up and up and down up and off maps over the ages and then up here we have norway islander which is probably iceland another island here called iraya i think iraya uh Varaja, what's that a vortex uh, like a whirlpool maybe but the thing is when you get to the top here you just got to cross this straight, and this is Mare Setan Trional Jaya Seato. Uh, Mare is, or Mare, Mary is water. And then across, across here, we have land at the North Pole. This is it, as you'll see. So here we have. And this is just to show you how easy it would have been for King Arthur to actually get to the North Pole. We've got Scotland, let's jump across to these islands. Then you can either go this way or this way and up across this strait. And this is basically there's a bit of land here. And then in the middle here we have the four uh, land masses of Hyperborea. So pretty interesting. Here we have Terra Incognito, and what looks to be some kind of griffin. And they're all there. It says Griffo. We've got a griffin there, and this is the North Pole region as they drew it in 1587. As you can see, lots of land up here in the North Pole, and of course now uh, this is has all disappeared. But what's happened is they've the space has gone too. They've pulled these continents in because these continents are different here than, than we see them today. And I will take another look at this map uh, with some new information that has come on board recently. Uh, we may actually be looking at something that's different than what we think it is. But anyway, just on this map and the way it's drawn, this is Europe, Great Britain, and you can pop straight up to the North Pole and I did want to show you one more thing because they mentioned uh, the pygmies or we saw the pygmies on another map 
and around here, pygmy. So we have uh, uh, maybe this. They're saying this is Greenland, Groenlandia, uh, quasi pygmies. So there you go. And this has actually got some other interesting people on this map as well. If we go down to the bottom, this is the bottom of South America. Looks a little bit different. But you'll see we have the region of the giants. And some uh, strange birds. So there you go, guys. Bit of a look at the, uh, the North Pole. And what was really going on? You know, they tell us that uh, there's no land there. They tell us there's nothing there now except, except for water and ice. And, you know, the poor polar bears, all the ice is melting and they've got nowhere to, to sit. Um, and this is what they tell us. But clearly, like back in the day, everyone was drawing land masses at the North Pole. And now we're told it's just the realm for Santa Claus. All right, hope you enjoyed that one, guys. Uh, yeah, this is just part one. I've got a few more things, uh, some interesting information I want to share with you about, you know, the, the Arctic and the Antarctic and what might be going on energetically. So that'll be coming up for you soon. So thanks for spending some time with me. Have an awesome day, and I shall talk to you all on the next upload. Bye for now.